Okay, Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera. Okay, today we start uh, our lesson for our professional engineer and for today's topic, we will learn about ethics in pro engineering profession. This is lecture 5, okay? Okay, first, basically, uh, and I believe that all of you know what's the meaning of ethics and what is the de definition of ethics. Okay, basically, ethics is regarding the moral principle, honesty, right, fairness, responsibility, concerns, choice, honors, value, and integrity of someone. And for the prof engine, for the ethics, engineering ethics, okay, this is applied for engineers. Okay, ethics in engineering profession. Ethics issue are seldom black and white. Personal ethics and professional ethics. Ethical standards are usually relative and personal. There is seldom an absolute standard. Okay, so basically ethics. Okay, sometimes uh, we know ethics as what is wrong and what is right. And basically, ethics also cover the personal ethics and the professional ethics. Okay, and then there is no clear standards okay, saying what is ethics about. Okay, and then there is a seldom and absolute standard of ethics. Study in engineering ethics can guide us in resolving the moral dilemmas we might encounter. So this is the importance of studying the engineering ethics, whereas it can guide engineers or the future engineers regarding the moral values when they face any dilemmas that they encounter during their task or job given. Being responsible is what a professional is all about. And then our goal is to become morally autonomous in the performance of our duties. Engineering failures due to ethics are not new. The failure has been caused by problems in design, construction, construction, and safety protocols. Okay, this is the importance of studying ethics. Okay, sometimes engineer itself face the dilemmas, okay, which relate which uh which later influence the ethical or the moral uh, decision made by the engineers. And then these decision that made by the engineers might influence okay the design the construction and safety protocols what on the on on the things that they work on okay this is the five famous engineering failures due to ethics first is the titanic second is the love canal third is the fort pinto uh third is the fort pinto fourth is the grand Han regency hotel walkway uh, fifth is the Tokama Narrow Bridge. Okay, so let's see. Okay, uh, what is the ethical dilemmas or ethical problem cause the sink of the Titanic? Water, the birthplace of life, sustainable. Inner of life, ancient highway since the first ore was carved. Since the dawn of time, man has tried to tame the power of water, to turn it to his own purpose. Sometimes he succeeds when he fails. It can be spectacular. As history progressed, builders of ever more complex systems and machines were discovering that the more complex the system, the more things there are to go wrong. The Titanic, I think, is one of the most classic illustrations of that. Had just any number of things, just one thing been different, the disaster wouldn't have happened. She was the biggest, the most luxurious, the most expensive. Millionaires used their influence to get tickets on her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York. Then, at 11.40 p.m., the fifth day out, she struck an iceberg. 1,507 souls went down to the bottom. Yet the total area of the holes in her side were only about the size of a refrigerator. What happened to sink the unsinkable ship? 
The killer is when the top of the bulkhead goes below the water line, that allows the next bulkhead and the cascade to be flooded. See, so what happens? As soon as the weight of the front pulls the top of the next bulkhead below the water line, then the water can cascade into the following bulkheads. That's the mechanical cause of the disaster. But mystery still remains. How did the iceberg rip through the double steel hull? Not very tough steel. There's no question that the plate in the Titanic could, could not be used in a ship today. But we do see linear indications that look like the seams fail. Bad rivets or bad steel. We've pulled up a couple rivets. They don't look very good. So the rivets weren't very good, and the hull plate was not very good. The steel in the Titanic's hull was far inferior to modern steel in one crucial respect. Because of its high sulfur content, it became brittle as it got colder. That meant in the icy North Atlantic, the Titanic's hull was more prone to breaking rather than bending. And new studies indicate the three million rivets that held the ship together were made badly even by the standards of the time. Whole seams zipped open when she hit the iceberg. It's hard to imagine the most luxurious ship ever built. But underneath the gold leaf and mahogany, they used bad steel and poor rivets to hold her together. Okay, this is okay. This is the study case about the Titanic. What can we conclude is that okay, the sum of the Titanic ship okay was caused by the material use, the steels, and also the rivet. Okay, and then this uh, the use the decision of purchasing or choosing this type of materials are based on the design. So this could be an ethical uh, problems during that time, where the person in charge of building this uh, Titanic was uh, doing something which is not according to the standard, where the person bought the steels uh, which are not uh, as standard as it's supposed to be and the rivet use are not according to standard. This caused uh, the ship to be sunk and not tough. Okay, That's why when the ship uh, hit the iceberg, instead of the steel bending, it started to break okay? in the size of a refrigerator, the holes. Okay. Okay, this is one type of the ethical uh, problems in engineering in fields. Okay, and then this is another study case. This is regarding the love canals. Okay, the love canals is the first major environmental disasters. Okay, the initially the project uh, started in 19 sorry 1894. Okay, and then the aim at that time was to build a canal in the Niagara Falls, okay, which is to bring water and hydroelectric power to the city. Okay, but however, later in the year 1947, the canal was sold to a to Hooker Chemicals and Plastic Corporation. Okay, at that time, okay, the previous uh, company that buy the canal, okay, uh, had uh, left uh, the project unfinished. So the next company, the Hooker Chemicals and Plastic Corporation, started to finish the canal. But however, they finished the canal just using clay. Okay, after they finish uh, building the canal using the clay, and then they started to dump chemicals and waste inside the canal. And afterwards, okay, in 1953, okay, again the canal was sold to another. Uh, to uh, so so again to another person or entity, okay. At, but however, at this time, okay, the project was to build elementary school and houses. Okay, the controversy remains over whether Hooker or Niagara Falls Boards of Education who choose the site to build the school and houses. Okay, and who is responsible for the consequence for building on that site? Okay, during the construction of the school, homes and sewer line were built on and through the canals. The clay lining broke. Okay, and then just remember the second company that bought the canal, the Hooker Chemical Embassy, after they 
finish within the canal using clay, they starting they started uh, to dump chemical and waste inside the canal. Okay, and then when they another company buy to build houses and schools, okay, at that time, okay, the clay lining started to broke and chemicals began sweeping into the ground. Okay, absorb into the ground. Okay, eventually a state of emergency was declared by New York residents reported. Okay. Uh, how the consequence of the chemicals uh, being assaulted by into the ground is that the residents have been reported of miscarriage, birth defects, cancer, and other disorder. Okay, and then until today, the ramification of the environmental and engineering failures still impacts building and policies today. This is one uh, another example of engineering ethics, uh, which is fan study case. Okay. The third is about the Fort Pinto. Okay, the Fort Pinto we already uh, see uh, the study case previously. Okay, this is regarding the design of the Fort Pinto fuel tank. Okay, whereas the company the company designed it uh, wanted to reduce its cost in terms of selling the Fort Pinto in a lower cost so it can be a competitive market. Okay, however, the design of placing the fuel tank at a lower part but, uh, has led to a great disaster or consequence where in terms of impact or, or accidents okay it started to uh, explode okay the third is uh, the fourth is regarding the high urgency hotel walkway today's guest video is from Brady at practical engineering He's talking about a tragedy, and the lessons we learned and the reasons why it happened are fascinating. Also, he made his own props. Brady, take it away. In the summer of 1981, the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri, hosted a large party in the multi-story atrium area. During the event, suspended walkways on the second and fourth floors collapsed, killing over 100 people and injuring over 200 more. At the time, the accident was the worst structural failure in US history. In the wake of the disaster, investigators discovered a change to the original design of the walkways that was proposed by the fabricator and mistakenly approved by the structural engineer. What at first glance seemed like a subtle adjustment to the design turned out to be the root cause of the failure. Two suspended walkways span the atrium in the Hyatt Regency, with the second floor walkway directly below the fourth floor walkway. Each was supported by a series of box girders, suspended by hanger rods and retained by nuts and washers. The original design called for a single pair of hanger rods, which would pass through each fourth floor girder to the second floor girder below. The fabricator responsible for constructing the walkways objected to this plan because it would require screw threads for the entire length of the hanger rods, which could easily be damaged during construction. So they proposed to split the hanger into two points, one to connect the fourth floor walkway to the roof, and one to connect the second floor walkway up to the fourth floor girders. If you don't notice the significance of this change, you're not alone. It was approved by the engineer without a detailed review or calculations which would have revealed its inherent flaw. In this setup, which represents the original design, the load of the two walkways is independently transferred to the hanger rods. Notice how I can lift each girder without affecting the other. Now let's look at the design change. In this configuration, notice that the entire weight of the second floor walkway is being borne not directly by the hanger rod, but instead by the girder above. If I lift the fourth floor walkway, the second floor walkway is lifted as well. The hanger rods are still carrying the same load at the top, but the two nuts on the upper girder are supporting the weight of both walkways. This simple change effectively doubled the load on those bolted connections. Imagine that you and a friend are both hanging on a rope. The original design is the equivalent of you both holding onto the rope independently, whereas the design change is the equivalent of your friend hanging onto your ankles. The total weight supported by the rope is the same in both cases, but your likelihood of maintaining a grip is not. This subtle change was identified by investigators as the primary cause of failure. With so many people on the walkways that evening, 
the load on the connections was too great. The box girders split open, slipping past the washers and nuts, leading to the collapse of both walkways. There is an implicit handshake between a society and its engineers. We hardly have a choice but to trust that the constructed environment we live in is safe and sound. When an engineer seals a design, he or she takes responsibility for its accuracy and safety to the general public. But to err is human, and that includes engineers. So we try to develop conventions and processes that can catch and correct for mistakes before they get too far. And that includes studying and learning from errors made in the past. The failure of the higher agency walkways is an important case study, taught to nearly every engineer with the goal that such a tragedy will never occur again. Practical Engineering is filled with great videos, so go subscribe. I would recommend starting with Graydon's video on hydrostatics. Next time, a guest video with a prop that has been to the moon. Okay, so basically, what happened? Okay, basically, okay, uh, this is a failure that caused a great disaster. Okay, and the failure is first uh, due to the engineer itself where he approved uh, without do a detailed review and calculation. Okay, and then second is the duty of the engineer to have the responsibility of the accuracy as well as the safety of the general public. Okay. Okay, now the video is about the Tacoma Narrow Bridge. One of the fundamental jobs of an engineer is to compare loading conditions to strengths. If the loads exceed the strengths, you know you've got a problem. Buildings and other structures face a huge variety of loading conditions, including floods, snow, rain, ice, earthquakes, and crowds of people. One of the most interesting forces faced by civil structures is the wind. Hey, I'm Grady, and this is Practical Engineering. Today, we're diving into one of the classic case studies of engineering failure, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. More on that later. A bridge is a quintessential civil structure. Humanity's need to get from one place to another without getting wet is as old as history itself. And for so many years, there was one force with which bridge engineers had to contend, gravity. The fundamental question of bridge design was this, how can we hold up the structure itself and all the people and vehicles that may cross it against the force of gravity pulling them down? And secondary to that, how can we do it economically for the least cost to the public, since most bridges are funded by the taxpayer? So over time, bridge designs evolved with our understanding of structural engineering and ability to create better construction materials into lighter and more efficient shapes. One of those shapes being the suspension bridge. A suspension bridge is essentially just a deck, two towers, two main cables, and connector rods which suspend the deck, hence the name. The primary advantage of suspension bridges is that they can so efficiently span long distances with only two towers, reducing the amount of material required and more importantly the cost. This advantage of being able to span long distances while minimizing material gives suspension bridges their iconic, slender and graceful appearance. But that same lack of material reduces the rigidity and stiffness of the structure where before bridges were generally stiff enough that gravity was the only load that needed to be considered, now a new force started to impact their designs, the wind. In July 1940, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge opened to traffic between Tacoma, Washington and the Kitsap Peninsula. At the time, it was the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Financing construction of the bridge was a major obstacle, which led the state to pursue an innovative design. Rather than the originally proposed trusses, the bridge used two narrow plate girders to stiffen the deck, giving the bridge its iconic steel ribbon appearance across the Puget Sound. Unfortunately, that analogy extended beyond its appearance. Even during construction, it was apparent that the bridge was too flexible, even under moderate winds. Construction workers gave it the nickname Galloping Gertie. 
Only four months after it opened, the bridge collapsed in dramatic fashion. In fact, this failure was so dramatic, there's a good chance you've seen this video before. So what's happening here? You've probably heard of resonance, which is where a periodic force syncs up with the natural frequency of a system. The classic example is a swing. With resonance, small periodic driving forces, like pushing someone in a swing, can add up to large oscillations over time because energy is stored. In the case of wind-induced motion, the periodic driving force comes from an effect called vortex shift. This is where fluid flowing past a blunt object oscillates as vortices are formed on the backside. When these alternating zones of low pressure occur at a frequency near the natural frequency of the structure, even small amounts of wind can lead to major oscillations. This is why some chimneys are equipped with helical vanes to create turbulence and break up the vortices. The day of its failure, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge did experience resonance from vortex shedding. You can see this in the vertical undulations for which the bridge was famous. But this resonance isn't why it failed. About 45 minutes before failure, a different kind of oscillation started. You can see in the historical footage that right before failure, the bridge isn't oscillating vertically, but in a twisting or torsional motion. The reason for this change in oscillation is still debated but one of the best suggestions has to do with the aerodynamics of the bridge. Rather than a truss through which wind can flow, the shape of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge with the large steel plates on either side created some strange interactions with the wind. Any small amount of twist in the bridge created vortices or areas of low pressure in locations that actually amplified the twisting motion. Each time the bridge returned to its natural state, its momentum twisted it in the other direction, where the wind could catch it and continue the cycle. This phenomenon is called aeroelastic flutter. It's the same reason that a strap or sheet of paper vibrates in the wind. It's a completely separate mechanism than resonance from vortex shedding because the periodic forces are self-induced from the naturally unstable aerodynamic shape of the bridge. This flutter eventually created too much stress in the suspension cables, and the bridge failed. One way that modern bridges avoid flutter is to include a gap in the center of the deck so that the pressures on either side can equalize. I cut a slide in my model, and sure enough, the vibrations almost completely stop. Another option is just to make the bridge deck more aerodynamic to avoid creating vortices that push and pull on the structure. Of course, bridges aren't the only civil structures affected by the wind. Take a look at the very first practical engineering video about two mass dampers to learn about how wind-induced motion can be mitigated in skyscrapers. For a simpler example, take a look outside at just about any high-voltage power line. You might notice small devices hanging near the insulators in each pulley. These are stock bridge dampers that help suppress wind-induced vibration on long cables and signs. And of course, other types of engineers contend with flutter as well. I've heard that airplanes are designed for wind loads, but I can't confirm it. These days, we have a much better understanding of the variety of loading conditions that can be faced by bridges and other structures. But much of our current understanding has come from failures of the past. The case of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge is a well-known cautionary tale that's discussed in engineering and physics classrooms across the world. The main lesson isn't necessarily that you should make sure to consider aeroelastic effects when you design a suspension bridge, even though you definitely always should. But I think more importantly, it's a reminder of how profoundly capable we are of making mistakes. When you push the envelope, you have to be vigilant because things that didn't matter before start to become important. Unanticipated challenges are a cost of innovation, and I think that's something we can all keep in mind. Thank you for watching, and let me know what you think. Okay, first, regarding the Tacoma Narrow Bridge. Okay, the ethical concern is the stakeholder framework. Stakeholders, investor. The investor want less design, less expensive design. Meanwhile, the designer want a certain aesthetic uh, design. So they want to push for new technologies. What the people want, they want safety of using their bridge. So what is the proper way to balance these requirements?
So how? As an engineer, what an engineer will do, okay, to gather all these things. Which one is most important? Which one is the priority? Okay, pushing for new technologies is not applicable in this scenario. Okay, because the new technologies relate to safety issues. And then no adequate recognized theory existed to do theoretical analysis. No experimental knowledge of such design existed. And the modeling was made after construction. And therefore, the modeling are required to be made before the construction. Finished before collapse, but without enough time to implement the solutions. Okay, so as conclusion, the Tacoma Narrow Bridge case study is an example of an ethical problem brought about by an oversight from engineers. There were many concerns during this building process and after the opening of the bridge, most safe attempt to push engineering to its limit was a gamble that ended up costing, his, costing him and others. This incident allowed us to learn about engineering disasters and the repercussion of taking shortcuts. Engineering is used to meet the demands of society. Therefore, it must be efficient and cost-effective. This demand can lead to shortcuts that reduce the cost of fabrication, which can cause unexpected failures. Engineers are tasked with the ethical duty of fulfilling the needs of society with public safety and the wellness of society being in the forefront. So this is the most important. The public safety and the wellness of the society in the progress of innovation to reduce the cost of new technologies, the strike for public safety is to be considered before the implementation and of the technologies. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you.